All right, here's the deal. I wanted to review this game. I can't. Diablo Immortal puts its best foot forward, but the problem is the rest of it follows. You see all those sub-level 40 opinions you get at launch day? No, that is not the game. Not one bit. Let's go. Well, like all good cash extraction systems, Immortal does, of course, give you a free hit. Now, the start of the game is pretty moody. You're approaching town in this little boat. Uh, the voice acting is, is excellent. Now, I'm playing this game on a 12.9-inch iPad Pro with a DualSense controller, so it feels great to control. The colors pop, the frame rate's a solid 60. I'm instantly taken into a little dungeon, and it feels great. It's a little bit simple, yes, but... I mean, what Diablo game isn't simple in the beginning? Soon, I meet Deckard Cain. I mean, Deckard Bloody Cain. There he is. There's acoustic guitar music. At this point, all the boxes are being ticked. I'm getting new gear quick. There's no monetization really popping up in my face. I'm getting more powerful. I'm being introduced to the narrative of this game. Basically, you know, all the post-World Stone stuff. Got to collect all these fragments strewn across Sanctuary. Um, right? And they're powerful, they're dangerous, so they quickly become targets for those who wish to do ill. So, I am here, I meet Deckard, and I'm gonna stop all this stuff. It seems reasonable. I'm intrigued enough. I mean, here we are. With Deckard. Oh, suddenly I'm fighting Leoric again. Okay. Feels quite Diablo. But, uh, well, then the game starts to show its true colors. Okay, so like Leoric's dead and stuff, by now I've unlocked the Battle Pass and my first clear bonus bundle for the first dungeon. The one that hilariously includes so few orbs that there's only one thing you can buy from the store with them and it's really not that useful at all. These are frustrating things, but at this stage of the game they genuinely do not feel required. No, not at all. While absolutely a free-to-play game, it still does feel like Diablo at this stage. And I get the impression that the game could go somewhere, that there may be some sort of excellent game underneath the layers of obvious monetization, maybe the sort of thing where you could ignore the monetization, never want to climb the leaderboards, and maybe you could have some fun with it or something like that. A little, of course, do I know at this stage that rather than the game merely having bolted on purchases, that a lot of the purchases are actually quite deeply ingrained to the game loop. Bit rough, but it still feels pretty good at this early stage. After saving the locals, Kane and I head to the big smoke. And what starts off feeling like an introduction to game mechanics and learning more about the lore and what we're going to be doing, quickly devolves into just having one of the most recognizable characters in the franchise spouting a bunch of hokey dialogue about how important legendary gems are only for me to later find out how they actually work. You see, Immortal does the typical free-to-play thing of layering complex systems that whales, in about, you know, 20 or so days after they start playing the game, end up just getting hooked and spend near infinite amounts of money on. And that's the thing with the legendary gems. At this stage, I know that they are a thing. I know that the crests go into the rifts and that's how I get the legendary gems. But the thing is, at this stage, as a regular player, you don't really know the difference between a one-star, two-star, and then five-star gem. And you just think, oh, the game gave me a few legendaries on the house. Great. Uh, fair enough. I guess I don't feel like I need to do any of that stuff. So the free hit here that they give you, obviously, is a free hit of some legendary crests to kind of get you started. You know, give you one or two gems. You feel really powerful after that. You continue in your merry way only for it later to dawn on you what's really going on. And through the next zones, I, I quest. And the tone is dark. I mean, I save a teen after her father dies. Then she's killed in front of me, and it's gruesome. This sure is Diablo. The second zone's actually quite neat. By its end, I do a decent dungeon and uh, deal with another world stone shard. Then I kind of realize, hang on a second. Is the storyline just me going from zone to zone dealing with shards? Because unfortunately, they kind of are just disconnected zone-based plots for chasing down the shards, with essentially no real A plot to speak of with much meat to it. It's basically just a big collection quest. This was a worry that set in, and sadly it is one that only would become, uh, well, more kind of well-founded as I would go through the game. Now, by this stage, I'm maybe around the 30s. It's 
pretty noticeable that a lot of the game is just Diablo 3. When I go to Chaldeum, I really notice that. But I don't really mind that as much as a lot of other reviewers. I didn't play a humongous quantity of D3, and uh, the game felt fun enough and my expectations were not sky high to start with. But then the story just stopped. Okay, turns out I've got to go and get more XP. So I do greater rifts, I do a few bounties, which are essentially just mindless dailies, but soon after, things turn sour, and it all starts to click. Diablo Mortal screeches to a halt. After round level 40, what happens is you're routinely hard locked out of campaign progress until you hit a certain character level. So it turns out there's actually not that much campaign content in the game. There's not. And the leveling runtime is just padded out by daily grinds. And what becomes extremely clear, however, is the bizarre placement of XP in this game. Because you don't actually get that much XP from running a rift or clearing a dungeon. But what you do get is battle pass progress. And it actually turns out that every time you level your battle pass, you get a bunch of XP. And that's your main source of XP. Now, a certain event will maybe have a double uh, battle pass uh, progress uh, event for like a, a limited number of runs. So you're basically clearing your bounties and you're just grinding that out. And then you're just grinding other battle pass activities. That's the way to go. The pass is so core here. And what they've done with this is they've trained the viewer to just see and view much of the game through the lens of doing battle pass activities. Rather than, you know, getting XP by doing content, you are ranking up your battle pass to get XP. It's not subtle what they're doing here. All the while, of course, you're leveling up the free track of the battle pass. You look down at the premium. It's full of rewards that you've technically earned via gameplay, but you just haven't been given because you haven't paid. I mean, that's a standard enough battle pass thing. For my own personal side of things, I thought, okay, $4.99, I guess the way to play this game is probably as some sort of battle pass Andy. That's not being a crazy whale, but I mean, if I'm going to give them a fiver roughly every month, surely the uh, what I get in return for that and the overall uh, way the game will feel should feel a bit more premium then. Spoiler, it doesn't. Now, this whole thing with the Battle Pass is one of the many, many ways that Immortal consistently guides you towards its store and its monetized things. You know, beyond the very obvious get more buttons that are pretty much everywhere with the game's various different currencies. And this is where Immortal truly began to like just lose me. They did not create enough narrative content to hold you through the 60 levels. So instead, they dole it out very thin and then they just push you into the habit-forming activity that is battle pass leveling. And I actually don't even think it does a great job of this as a free-to-play game. This part of the game straight up just feels boring and unrewarding. I think Diablo would make more money for whales if this was compressed, but maybe I'm just wrong. Now, of course, it feels un unrewarding. That feeling of it being unrewarding can always be counteracted, of course, by just purchasing a bunch of legendary crests. Because that's going to give you a greater rift run that will have guaranteed a whole bunch of legendary gem loot. So, if you want to continue the nice little dopamine rush that's keeping you motivated as the game is really fast-paced towards the beginning, if you want to keep that, like, same level of, oh, this game is engaging me. Oh, I'm getting a little pellet out of the Skinner box. If you want to keep that pace going, you do have to cough up in the way that they've done it. Now, eventually, I do push through some of these level caps. I do the leveling content in the big mountain zone with the monks. And you know what? It's just fine. Again, it's barely connected. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's much of an overall narrative other than deal with the world stones. <sighs> And it's the sort of thing where Diablo 3's story was a mess, but at least it tried to weave a story through its acts. Immortal just makes no attempt at that type of cinematic storytelling. I'm not saying a Diablo game needs to do that, but I'm saying that the way that they did it in Immortal just isn't particularly engaging. Now, by the time I'm level 50, the full gravity of all of this is really hitting me. Uh, it ain't pretty. And this is really where I just kind of decide, nope, Screw this, I'm going to record my thoughts, and I'm never going to touch this game again. 
So first up, I learned the difference between, of course, the 1, 2, and 5 star gems, and then just how insane the upgrade acquisition loot or loop is, right? I mean, you can pay to skip months and months ahead of a free player's experience. Hell, they even directly sell a four-star legendary gem in the store, and I think it's like 140 pounds, because it's actually three different microtransactions that you've got to smoosh together. Just they're not microtransactions. That's the price of three or two or three AAA games. It's insane. Now, you get a few legendary crests pretty soon, but after that, they really dry up. And the thing is, this is overtly selling progress, and while Wyatt is right in that it's not buying gear, it 100% is buying power. Because whether it's your gems or your gear, it all just goes into your combat rating, and that is what the game counts as, really, as being your power. Wordcraft is not going to get you out of this one, Wyatt, especially because we then find out that because of the insane upgrade costs and how the magic find is better on five-star gems, that friggin' players who spend a whole bunch of money to get loads of five-star gems will actually have more magic find. That means that they will get higher quality drops in the game. They will get more triple stat legendaries and things like that, which of course give them more combat rating. And is that technically selling gear? No, but it's basically like you can pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars to have your own weird magic find boost because of how they have done these gems. And to be very clear, for a free-to-play player to get a similar amount of magic find, that is going to take years. It, this game is mad. Then I find the Heliquary. Multi-person bosses. Seems neat, seems really cool. I hop into one, it's a pretty cool boss fight, and then the whole group falls apart, so that's kind of unfortunate. Fortunate. But then, of course, I realize that the Heliquary is um, tied to player power and money. And at that point, I'm like, oh, cool. I don't want to play you anymore because you've pumped it full of money. So the Heliquary is like this box, right? Now, you upgrade it with a rare resource that makes it just give you more power. And also, it means that it has more slots. And into those slots, you can basically place trophies from the bosses that you kill. And I've got to say... If this was unmonetized, this could be a really awesome system. But it is monetized, those upgrade slots. There's various different uh, between bundles and purchases that get you that upgrade resource. And at this stage, I'm just like, man, this isn't an optional thing. You have deeply ingrained the money bit into the gameplay loop. Screw you. And the bundles start to get crazy. What started at 89 pence, just over a dollar for, for you guys in America, that's now 17.99 for me. And then a German viewer sends me a bundle that he saw in his store. It's 50 euro. It's the Hell 1 difficulty version of one of the uh, earlier on bundles in the game that's super cheap. 50 euro. Then he sends me another one that's like 23 euro. And then worse still, I of course, I'm going around the game's UI, I find the Prodigy's Path which is basically a second battle pass, where the premium tier gets you legendary crests and uh, Heliquary upgrade resources. I mean, ouch. And then I see a new material. I see a new material in the store, or at least I didn't notice it before. This material is a dawning echo that wakes up new powers and legendary equipment that's got a rank 10 legendary gem inside it. That costs a thousand orbs. You cannot buy 1,000 orbs. 630 costs 899, 1650 costs 2199. So I guess you'll just have to buy more than you need, of course. Uh, but obviously, getting that uh, gem upgraded to rank 10, I mean, if that's a two star gem, you're going to need dupes. That's going to be super expensive and basically not a super achievable thing for a free to play player. And then I noticed the platinum currency, and then I noticed the market, and what a deadly combination these two things are. So, head to the market board, right? One star legendary gems, they're like a few hundred platinum. Maybe a few dollars worth at most. Cheap. Reinforces how one star legendary gems are just basically friggin' useless, right? Um, and then scroll down to the five star gems. Now, of course, remember, a five-star gem can drop at two out of five, three out of five, four out of five, and five out of five. And then the up the upgrade costs there are just insane. So, like, so insane, of course, the Blizzard are directly selling that rank four out of five legendary for around 140 quid. Pounds. <laughs> Shouldn't be too colloquial. Uh, okay. It's getting mad. 
because you can you can spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds, hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars in the market board. It's mad. And of course, for that legendary gem that they directly sell in the in-game store, well, that appeared for me at some point in an area that is labeled specials in the bundle section. So clearly they intend to run more specials over time. So it's only going to get worse from here. They're going to keep on directly selling legendary gems. And then as for the market board, I mean, there's legendary gems that are costing anything from like 50 pounds to well over 500 pounds. That's like 600, 700 dollars. And that makes sense in terms of the rarity. And while the, you know, the number crunched averages are a bit lower, like you see the streamer Quinn spending like 7,000 uh, USD. He ended up spending way more than that um, until he actually got a five-star gem. And then what's really absurd is, of course, when Josh Strife Hayes noticed something, he noticed that legendary gems that drop from Battle Pass, Prodigy's Path, or the single uh, sort of free-to-play legendary quest that you get per month, those are bound, meaning they can't be sold. And that does mean that every single gem purchased from the market board uh, is with Platinum. And of course, Platinum is a currency you're in a small, a small enough amount of. Therefore, the people who are buying the highly expensive Platinum gems, or, you know, gems with Platinum, the market board, well, they're going to be spending real money. Now, remember, the gem that they're buying with maybe 400 pounds worth of money converted into Platinum or 300 or whatever, the gem that they're buying with that originally dropped from a paid legendary uh, crest run one that people just bought a whole bunch of crests for in the in-game store. Perhaps they were, you know, using 10 crests to do a single Greater Rift run. And that means that for every one of those four-star, maybe five-star gems that you see in the market board in your server, basically someone, or like the aggregate of people, have done what Quinn did and just dropped like 10 grand. And then decided to just go sell the gem because maybe they didn't want it, maybe it was a dupe, I don't know. And that just means that for every gem that then drops via a crest, isn't wanted, and is then sold on the board, Blizzard are making all of the legendary crest money that it took to drop that gem, and then they're making a whole bunch of money all over again as soon as the market board is used with platinum. That's the thing with the way that it works with platinum. It's not just like it's a real money transaction between you and another player and Blizzard acts like eBay and skims some off the top. No, it is way more deeply monetized for them. This stuff is disgusting, but to my shock, of course, it would get worse. Uh, the game then, you know, introduced me to another friggin' mechanic called the Heradric Legacy or some bullshit. Basically, right, you do a wee dungeon, you get these big gems, you stick them in the Heradric bullshit box. Then the game shows you, like, a new little section of the dungeon, you delve into the Ancient Order's ruins and stuff. Turns out it's all piss easy anyway, and as you fight mobs, those mob dro mobs drop keys, okay? And then soon you emerge into a room full of chests. Those chests use those keys to open, getting you an amount of small gems. And it turns out those small gems actually upgrade the big gems that are in the Heradric Legacy bullshit box thingy uh, to just give you more power. And once tutorialized, you then realize that if you head back in, there's even more chests. But you won't have any keys. But no worries, because it transpires that you can open them for a measly 500 platinum anyway. Of course, you'll easily have 500 Platinum being a free-to-play player, but if you want to open a whole bunch of them, at least immediately, you will have to swipe. Now, 500 Platinum costs 50 orbs. So there you go. That's the one thing that 89 pence bundle from the beginning can get you. Now, if you want to open multiple of these, maybe you want 5,000 Plat. Well, that costs 500 orbs. You can't buy 500 orbs. 315 orbs costs 449, while 630 costs 899. So there you go. Got him. You're always spending more than you need because obviously that spare change is going to reduce your friction for your next purchase because you've already just got some money left over in your Diablo Immortal account effectively. The bastards. Then I touch some PvP. Now, there's weird shit going on here. There's the whole uh, Immortals versus Shadows thing. Then there's the Battleground-style PvP. You know what? It all seems kind of neat, potentially even some fun. Then I see the difference between a swiper and a free player. The answer here is nope. I am not engaging in this complete bullshit. Uh, yeah, so if you thought the bullshit was over, you're, you're wrong. <laughs> 
Now, what the whales will tell you here is that this system means that eventually, you know, after the kind of ranks settle, you'll just have whales fighting whales, and then you'll have uh, minnows fighting minnows and free to plays fighting free to plays. And that's kind of like technically true, but it does mean that to climb the ladder, you need to just get more progress, get more resonance. It is directly predicated on buying power. So just that you can basically stay in the kiddie pool with all the other free to play, you know, nooblets, uh, apparently that to some people means that this is an okay form of monetization where like, Obviously, if you're playing PvP, you want to do better. So if you are a free-to-play player and you actually are really highly skilled at the game, sure, you're going to be able to beat more and more pre uh, people. And then you'll end up being matchmade against people who have got more and more purchased power because that's how those rankings are just going to gonna go. So no matter what, the PvP system is always coercing you into spending some more money. And uh, you know what? I've actually spoken to... Uh, former dev people, not in this project, but, you know, in and around Cali, uh, in and around free-to-play, and they're like, oh yeah, no, you see this whole PvP thing? It's basically just a humongous monetization funnel for the Chinese market. Just, if you weren't aware, by the way, like, those who are in the know all know what this is. It is just a money funnel for the Chinese market. And you know what the sad thing is? The PvP actually could have slapped. Could have been super, super, super fun. But as soon as I see the way it's monetized, nope. It's not a video game anymore. Screw you. Now it's time to talk about loot. So, loot's weird. People started reporting that there's actually daily uh, limits on how many legendaries. You know, like X legendaries per source. And then what's weird is Blizzard said, no, there, there isn't that. So maybe a bug caused that? I'm not exactly sure. But what I do know is that uh, gems, they're upgraded to rank 5 give more magic find. If that is a one or two star gem that a free-to-play player will get a little bit more realistically, I mean, to get a two star gem will take a free-to-play player like two and a half weeks of grinding the embers currency from rifts. Uh, but of course, that won't be enough to upgrade the rank of their two star gem to rank five. Doing so will actually require dupes of that very same gem, which honestly does make upgrading a rank two legendary gem like super unfeasible for a free to player a free to play player to do uh, now upgrading a rank 1 gem that is going to cost you like so many gems worth of gem power that even that i think is not particularly realistic for a free to play player so i would say that effectively the the time grind to unlock the magic find on your gems is insane for a free to play player and the amount of uh, more magic find that you can get as a pay-to-win player is just madness. So a pay-to-win person could easily enough be earning, or they could have like double the magic find of a free person. Easy. So whether there is some sort of hidden throttle or soft capped gear on a daily basis or whether there isn't, the core point is more magic find means you are getting more gear faster. It means you are getting higher quality gear that increases your combat rating faster. Right? And that means that the people who pay to engage in the whole legendary gem system are going to have a significantly faster rate of general gear progression. So when Wyatt says they're not selling gear, we, even before this magic find thing was discussed, we knew that he was technically correct, but not correct by the spirit of his words. Here, the same holds. He's just even more incorrect by the spirit of his words. And like, guess what? All this gear stuff is like pretty impactful at the end game. It's set up in a way where you'll want to clear more challenge rifts. You know, get your weekly leaderboard thing, but it's impossible if you're playing for free. And you know what? It's basically impossible if you're just a, as they're now called, battle pass Andy. Okay, let's go to where the game utterly dies for me. Okay then, so let's continue this shit show. Uh, difficulty levels are limited by your Paragon uh, level and your combat rating. Now your combat rating of course comes from your gear, the upgrades to your gear, your gems, the upgrades to your gems. If you go full pay to win mode, you will get loads of combat rating from your gems. Loads. The higher magic find will let you increase your combat rating faster. You'll probably have a higher chance of getting more triple, uh, triple stat legendary drops. And if you're not swiping, it's all going to be so much more slow and grindy. If you want those two-star legendary gems, basically via the Ember system, you'll get one every two and a half weeks. And then, of course, there is your uh, your monthly <laughs> your monthly legendary 
crest that you get, for, or yeah, that you get from the um, oh, one of the vendors. Now, the end game of Immortal, though, it totally trains you to focus in on the combat rating number, and then it sells you ways to improve it. And this is where I decided I'm not going to hit 60 and get into Paragon because I just saw what, what's being done. And it's like, no, I'm not putting myself through that for a goddamn YouTube video. Um, so as you're leveling up, you know, you're getting more of the special dungeon bundles. And for me, I hit level 55 and just knowing all of this stuff has me quitting the review, right? I mean, just fuck it. Fuck this game. Greedy bastards who have contorted Diablo into this disgusting, offensive, predatory mess of a game. Every aspect of player power is tied to the store in some way. Past that, uh, you know, free hit, the game just evolves into a boring piece of shit and it just attempts to shamble onwards. PvP could be a shining star of this game, but pay to win basically destroys that. Gearing and buildcraft could be fun, but pay to win gems completely destroy that. The challenge rifts are actually pretty fun, but even that is kind of destroyed because of everything else I've talked about and the connections to player power. You've got whole systems like the Heradric Legacy bullshit thing that are essentially just designed to be another pointless treadmill that you can pay to accelerate through. That is the core design tenet of this game, basically. And you know those hopes people had of a great 20-hour story? No! Deckard Cain is a pathetic shade of his former self, reduced to being the guy outside the friggin' sketchy restaurant, you know, spinning around a sign that just says limited time deal, get your legendary gems here. The story is paper thin, it has nothing of interest to say. The promise of it is there but goes nowhere. And even if it did, they ruined their pacing in order to educate you about the exciting perks and benefits of their battle pass. Those who have pressed on through these are just finding more and more of the systems just pushed and squeezed. That's the thing. Even people, from what I understand, who've hit level 60, they don't appreciate the squeeze of this game yet. Design problems like, say, Hell 2 Dungeons basically require four players. That's something that is really hard because of slow combat rating progress. That's just going to encourage more swipers. Why do they add a social dimension there? Because they want the social benefits of being a swiper. This is such common stuff. Because when you're getting to those high levels, you're going to run into more people who are swipers. It's going to seem more of a normal thing for you to do. We've already got the reports of people being maybe kicked from a group because they're just you know, they're, they're not really engaging that stuff. Their character isn't powerful enough. Um, I mean, the, the freaking weird classism in this game is bizarre. Even things like the whole Immortals versus Shadows mode. It's like, yeah, cool. I maybe would bother to engage with that. Then I see what it's like for players who jump into that and just find that, oh, one of the Immortal players is a swiper. Therefore, my team has lost. Do you want to clear challenge rifts fast? I mean, get lost because a whale can blast through them faster than you. And the whole thing is basically timed with uh, with a leaderboard. So Blizzard wants you to know that you can just pay for a better rank. The game is so scummy even that paid cosmetics are per character. Per character. A 17 pounds, 99 pence cosmetic that not, you know, if I went, made another demon hunter, that demon hunter couldn't use it. I have to buy the thing twice. Warcraft 3 Reforged was an embarrassment born of leadership not caring. This game is an embarrassment completely born of leadership's caring. And that's a really scary thing. Now we have a situation where the general manager and uh, senior vice president of Diablo 4 and their community lead are basically having to do tweets about how D4 is really going to be a real game, honest. It's not going to have all this bullshit. And you know what? I do actually believe them. I don't think they're going to pump this bullshit into D4. Maybe they'll do stash tabs, though. Maybe they'll just try to take a little inch if they can. But ultimately, what we know is that Immortal has evidently damaged the company's reputation so much that now senior people in D4 are having to communicate to people that D4 effectively is a real video game. And that's sad for them. I mean, PR will never let them say what people actually want to hear. People probably want to hear them say, Diablo 4 is a premium game with lots of post-launch content with zero pay-to-win elements. That's probably what they want to say. But if they say that, it's admitting the truth. That Blizzard's team and NetEase's team designed Diablo Immortal this way. And you can't squirm out of it. 
no matter how many, uh, you know, bizarre copium, uh, friggin' tweets Wyatt Chang likes, uh, that are just the people who are completely, you know, dazzled by this game and blinded by it and think, oh, pay to win, that's not a problem. The whales will sort themselves out into the elite tier and all the minnows can fight in the pit below them as if that's an okay thing. No, no, that's a load of bullshit. There's a load of bullshit. And just because, you know, there's a thing called, is it the naturalistic fallacy? It's the idea where, you know the way some people just say, oh, chemicals bad, I only eat natural things. And then a lot of people will come and be like, yeah, well, uh, guess what, my dude? Uh, loads of natural things will kill you. Loads of chemicals, some of them won't kill you. Guess what? Turns out, that's just, it doesn't make sense, right? The naturalistic fallacy is a fallacy uh, for a good reason. And I think a lot of people are using the naturalistic fallacy here in a way. They're basically saying that because these things are normal in the Chinese market, that they're normal in mobile games, that therefore they're okay when Blizzard does them. No, it doesn't work like that. If something's bad on a first principles basis, it's bad. It becoming more prevalent doesn't make it less bad. It just means that you're the frog and you've been boiled. So may this game burn in hell. Goodbye, Diablo Immortal. I am uninstalling you. If I never have to talk about you again, it will be a good thing. But let's be real. If they, I mean, if two months pass and they just see all of the whales that they've captured and they just go, oh, time to rinse them harder for season three. You're goddamn right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you all know what's going on because... <laughs> I mean, a company that once had a reputation doing this sort of thing, yeah, they should be punished in their public relations. It's as simple as that. It's a, it's a two-way street. You know, there's the consumers, there's the people making the products. Um, the main way that we consumers vote is with, with our money, but uh, we're allowed to talk about the things we don't like. We're allowed to self-organize a little bit. And I think this game is a massive rallying cry that we need to do that. Just, we need to do that. Because you can't help but wonder... If they could get away with this in D4, would they? That's why we have to make it very clear that they won't get away with it. That's it for me. Goodbye. I'll be back to games that don't make me angry for this channel very soon. Oh my god, I really need it. Have a great... I don't know when this is going up. Have a great week. Have a great weekend. Whatever it is, goodbye. <laughs>